Thank you everyone for coming. So hi, my name is David Leto. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary. And I'm going to be talking to you about evaluation strategies for HCI toolkit research. So this is a collaboration between myself, Stephen Hoven, Jover Mullen, Nikolai Marquardt, Laura Olberg, and Saul Greenberg. And you'll notice there's uh, bold and stars on our names on top. And that's because Stephen, Yo, and I contributed equally to the work. So the message for this talk is that despite the impact and success of toolkits, evaluation remains a challenge. We unveil four evaluation types based on past research, demonstration, usage, performance, and heuristics. And we examine what methods are used, when they might be appropriate, and how they are applied. So as you all know, the mother of all demos is turning 50 years old now. And uh, it's really interesting because it paved the way into how demonstrations can be used as a way to communicate a technology's uh, concepts and ideas. And this kept going all the way through other projects like um, a Sketchpad by Sutherland, as well as ubiquitous computing projects uh, at Xerox Park with, uh, led by Mark Weiser. And what's interesting here is that by creating toolkits, it is possible for us to actually create these bold visions of the future. So we can actually author them and then see what they'll be like before they can actually come into play. So I'm using the word toolkit, and I thought I would define it first. So what do I mean by toolkit? So toolkits are generative platforms designed to create new interactive experiences and artifacts, provide easy access to complex algorithms, enable fast prototyping of software and hardware interfaces, and or enable creative exploration of design spaces. And they're used in many areas of HCI, such as graphical user interfaces, information visualization, tangible user interfaces, and UbiComp. So why do researchers build toolkits in HCI? So the first reason is to reduce authoring time and complexity. So this idea that we can encapsulate concepts and simplify expertise. Second, it allows us to create paths of least resistance, which means that we're able to move people towards the right solutions and away from the wrong ones. It also allows us to empower new audiences so we can have new participants work in these areas. And one great example of that is how we can move from uh, developers creating user interfaces to designers by having interface builders. It also helps integrate with current practices and infrastructures. So it means that we can align our ideas to existing infrastructures and standards. So one example of that is D3 and how it was uh, integrated into the current web standards. And finally, it enables replication and creative exploration. So it allows people to replicate different ideas that can come together into a suite of tools that can explore an area and create more powerful solutions than ever before. So essentially, all of these goals are trying to get to this idea of opening new solution spaces. Now, the thing is that toolkits can create many different solutions by using, reusing, and combining the different building blocks. And this leads to a very large space, but the trade-off to that is that because we have this generative power, there's a large space that remains underexplored. And so the question is how we can go back to these uh, original goals that we established and know that we actually met them. So we found that there's very little overall reflection on what methods are being used, when they're appropriate, and how they might be applied. So we wanted to get more insight and find a way to have an informed discussion about this. Uh, so we can actually understand this. And so we, what we did was we looked at 68 representative papers. Uh, 50 of them were from ACM venues. And we applied a keyword and definition match. And we ensured that we also took 10 additional papers uh, that were also exemplary. From that, we applied uh, open coding and focus coding. And then we did thematic clustering. And we found four different types of evaluation, demonstration, usage, performance, and heuristics. So our data looks something like this. You can find that in our paper. Essentially, you can see all of uh, the different toolkits and how they use different uh, methodologies and how they come together, and some uh, descriptive uh, statistics as well. So I'm going to go over the different types of evaluation. And I will also apply and look at our own observations and reflections. In our paper, we actually discuss some of the challenges. Uh, I won't go into those because of time restrictions. Uh, but hopefully, uh, you have a time to look at that later. <laughs> 
So I'll start by looking at demonstrations. And essentially, the idea of demonstrations is that uh, people create examples and scenarios that can clarify how the toolkit's capabilities uh, come together and can enable people to create these claim applications. So by doing that, they can show how these different building blocks are coming together and creating these paths of leakage resistance. And they can also show the different workflows and how they're actually demonstrating that solution space that we talked about. And through that, they can show things like the threshold or how easy it is to get started. They can show the ceiling or the complexity of the application. Or they can go as far as to show the design space and the different breadth of things that they can do and how they fit a larger research theme. One way of doing that is through novel examples. So for example, they can show implementations of novel applications or interaction techniques, such as, as it was done in WorldKit, where they actually overlay projections on top of different objects. Uh, or one might choose to replicate existing examples. So that way they can show that one can author systems and techniques that were considered difficult uh, and show how these ideas can encapsulate the broader solution space. So one example of that is prefab. And in prefab, uh, the authors show how they can integrate very sophisticated interaction techniques that were really difficult to implement into everyday infrastructures uh, just by reverse engineering the pixels of this display. And so they can actually integrate all these without actually having to modify anything. And it's really interesting because a lot of authors have already started these types of discussions. So for example, in Prefuse, here and colleagues actually say that they re-implemented existing visualizations and crafted novel designs to test the expressiveness and the effectiveness, as well as the scalability of their toolkit. One might also uh, explore the design space. Uh, so it's this idea of uh, fitting the ideas into a broader research theme. So in Pineal, for example, uh, there's an, a design space exploration of how to author uh, passive objects that can become smart by adding a mobile device and looking at how sensors are integrated or repurposed. One might also do how-to scenarios, so having this step-by-step -step breakdown of uh, how to use the application. And so Retrofab here has examples of how to retrofit appliances and make them into IoT-compatible uh, objects. So they actually describe how the application would use it as if you had an end user working with it. So in our own reflections, we find a couple of things. Uh, one is to provide rationale for toolkit uh, design and examples. So there's a lot of principles that are being used, and it's important to clarify where these decisions are coming from. So authors may have their own experience in hand whenever they're creating these tools, so they'll actually understand where the, uh, where the problems are. And this inspires or leads to some form of autobiographical design uh, that defines uh, how they're actually creating these solutions. So one example of that is how D3 actually came from the creation of multiple toolkits in the past. One could also look at prior work and how the, um, uh, the research community has determined different problems that need to be solved right now. Similarly, one could also try to understand the intended target audience um, by using formative studies. And through that, they can actually discuss the boundaries and underlying assumptions so that they can explain what doesn't work well and what is actually complicated with the toolkit. So I'll move quickly into usage, which is this idea that one can uh, see who can use the toolkit as opposed to what the toolkit can do. And we can do that through usability, utility, and use. So one example uh, here is usability studies, which can look at speed, errors, performance, and documentation. So uh, paper mache actually does an API usability study that finds uh, issues with the documentation, which leads to iteration on the actual uh, document and the toolkit itself. People can also take some of these things home uh, to get some extensibility. So essentially, the idea is that they can uh, do some work on their own. So it's typically given to students, for example, uh, since they'll be early adopters of the toolkit itself. So, in that, we can find that uh, one thing that we reflected on was this idea of bringing utility into the picture. Uh, because even though a toolkit may be use, uh, usable, it may not be useful. Uh, we can select tasks more carefully so that they're representative and the measures can be appropriate to the claims made in the paper. And we can recognize that um, the consequences of the audience choice uh, matter. So things like having uh, undergrads do the toolkit may make sense if they're computer scientists uh, and we can extrapolate that idea to developers, but it may not be the case for um, other types of evaluation. In terms of performance, instead of looking what and who, it's about finding how well it works and finding the technical performance issues. So one can look at the minimum usage requirements or how things are improved over the state of the art. 
So some of the reflections include how different goals uh, go from uh, commercial to research toolkits and why these limitations are uh, being used or not, what, what matters, essentially. From there, we can do risky hypothesis testing and actually try to see when the toolkit breaks um, to truly understand the technical boundaries. We can facilitate replication and comparison through open access, and we can uh, discuss the implicit baselines. For example, 30 frames per second for uh, camera-based projects. Last thing I'm going to talk about heuristics, and it's this idea that we have strategies that are derived from previous experiences with similar problems. So a lot of this work uh, often goes to content dimensions of notation or Dan Olson's work in evaluating uh, toolkits. And these are based on tried success and can identify uh, what the toolkit addresses and what are the limitations. So for example, one can um, use these ideas as design guidelines to inform their design uh, early on. They can also use it to inform different evaluation types so they can actually take these heuristics and apply them to define tasks for user studies, for example. And we should be able to uh, be more transparent and distinguish when we're cherry picking versus when we're ignoring relevant heuristics by articulating why we're not including them. So, I'm going to step back a bit. I talked about the four types of evaluation. And um, essentially, we talked about these different um, techniques that are associated. And the first point is this idea of rethinking evaluation. Because it's not necessarily about which method is better, but which one is the most appropriate. And we have to reflect on which method is essential to the toolkit evaluation. And one way of doing that is thinking about what if we remove that method itself? Uh, will this affect the paper? And to what extent will it do that? One point that we had was this uh, evaluation by demonstration. Uh, if you look at our data, you can see that uh, a demonstration was used in almost all of the toolkits, while uh, usability or sorry, usage as well as performance were used about half or a third. And demonstration was used on its own, whereas the other ones tended to complement these demonstrations. And so the reason for this is because demonstrations can be uh, an effective way of uh, communicating the toolkit principles and concepts. So it's kind of like your best bang for your buck in a way. Uh, we still found, uh, although there were a lot of uh, really good usability studies looking at creative exploration and so on, uh, there were a lot of papers that are still just tacking usability studies at the end, um, which have small sample size or non-representative groups uh, that don't really show the path of resist least resistance. And so by doing this, the usage studies at best play a minor role in establishing and evaluating the novelty of the toolkit. But what's more interesting is that there's no indication whatsoever from the evaluation itself that the toolkit is actually successful, or uh, whether the, the success of the evaluation actually is tied to the, the success of the toolkit. Because we see a lot of toolkits that have enormous success within the research community, such as the uh, context toolkit. And we have uh, toolkits that are uh, widely used within uh, outside of research as well, like D3. So the fact that uh, this paper has looked at how uh, they actually did that, if you read D3, they actually state this. And they say that while we can quantify performance, accessibility is far more difficult to measure. The true test of D3's design will be user adoption. So I'll just reiterate the message one more time. Despite the impact and success of toolkits, evaluation remains a challenge. We unveiled four different types of evaluation techniques based on past research, demonstration, usage, performance, and heuristics. And we examined what methods are used, when they might be appropriate, and how they're applied. And this is the first attempt in doing so. Um, and it can, we hope that it can help HCI Toolkit Research move forward. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you very much. Uh, questions from the audience, please? Hi. Um, excellent paper. I enjoyed it very much. However, I want to ask a sort of broad question. Um, doesn't any kind of evaluation research method presume that you have a certain goal in mind? And one goal I would suggest is, that you might evaluate is, to what extent are these toolkits being adopted by people who are producing actual products and commercial software, et cetera? Um, now, that's not the only goal, but it would be one. And, I, and, and more generally, I think adoption against any purpose is probably the best form of evaluation. The others, the others are more predictors of success rather than evaluation of success. 
Thanks for your question. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, but also uh, we found that a lot of papers actually, because you have a toolkit, it was able to trigger discussions. So for example, the context toolkit uh, actually created a lot of discussion behind what it means to have uh, context awareness, and there were a lot of papers that were following up on that. So I think that it depends on what it is that the researchers are focusing on. Uh, but yeah, definitely adoption is one of those really important ones, for sure. Hi, uh, David Carger, MIT. Uh, this is very interesting. Uh, I, I'm curious, though, about the sort of biased nature of the sample that you, you only looked at papers that were published. Um, and I, I wonder um, if you have thought about whether it might be possible to get access to rejected papers and see if they have similar patterns or sort of what are, what are failure modes and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, and also not just that, but it would be interesting to see if papers were rejected and because of that they had to add a user study in the end or something like that. Yes. Uh, so in our data, yeah, it's very much biased by the, the things that are already out. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where the data will be open and we hope that people can contribute to it. So I'd be definitely intrigued to see if uh, people who got their toolkit rejected will be willing to actually say, hey, here's our stuff. So yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Are there other questions? All right. Well